Good evening. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the American Academy. My name is Christine Wallach, and I'm a trustee of the American Academy in Berlin. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's lecture by Kate Brown. Kate is this semester's Bosch Fellow in Public Policy. And I'd like especially to welcome Luisa Frey, who is here from the Bosch Stiftung. I'd also like to welcome Kate's family, her siblings, Julie Hofmeister and Elizabeth Marston, her son, Sasha Bamford Brown, and her partner, Marjolyn Kars. It's not often that fellows come so well accompanied by fellows, <laughs> by family. And I know she'll have a lot of support and stories to tell back home when she's there. As you probably know, um, it's become a tradition at the American Academy lectures that we ask an expert in the speaker's field to say a few words to introduce the respective fellow to the audience. And we're more than delighted this evening to have Dorothee Wierling, professor of history, giving the introductory marks to remarks about Kate Brown and her work tonight. Just a few words about Dorothee, if you don't know her. Uh, she's, of course, professor of German history at Hamburg University. She was also the deputy director of the Research Center for Contemporary History in Hamburg. Her most recent research is a very interesting topic, uh, the history of the coffee trade, uh, which is based in Hamburg. The world coffee trade is based in Hamburg, and that work will be finished soon with a book to come out uh, in the near term. Uh, dear Dorothee, we're very, very honored to have you, and we're grateful that you could find the time to introduce Kate Brown tonight. Thank you. Good evening. I was um, ordered to speak into the microphone, I, so I hope that you can all hear me. Um, uh, dear Christine Wallick, uh, dear Luisa Fry, dear fellows, guests, friends, and family of tonight's speaker, Professor Kate Brown, this year's Bosch Fellow in Public Policy. And Kate, last but not least, my special greetings go to you. I can't welcome you because I'm not, you're at home here, not I am. Anyway. Um, when Kate asked me to introduce her on this occasion, and I have to say, I'm not in a narrow sense a specialist in her field, actually, because I mean, I know Russia is partly Europe, but I'm a German historian. But I know her from being on her dissertation committee, and in that sense, I you know, profited from her expertise. But when Kate asked me to introduce her on this occasion, I felt so honored that I immediately accepted the invitation, although I also felt a little uneasy at the same time. And that was because Kate, when she you know, offered me the introduction, made it very clear that she expected me to be very short, <laughs> refrain from praising her too much, and altogether give a very low-key introduction. <laughs> I don't know if I would be able to keep my promise. I didn't know in the in the you know when you when you told me to. I just said I would do it. But if not, Kate, please forgive me. Um, Kate Brown started as a historian of Russia. She studied Russian language and literature at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and in Leningrad during the exciting years of 1987-88. And she received her bachelor degree in 1988. She then went to the University of Washington in Seattle, where we met, where she earned her master's degree in East European and Asian Studies in 1993 and wrote a dissertation on the border region between Poland and Russia in the first half of the 20th century, a study which was published by Harvard University Press in 2004 as a biography of no place from ethnic borderland to Soviet heartland. The book explores the multi-ethnic region without borders on which the Soviet regime exercised or rather executed all its bureaucratic power and physical violence to tame it. The publication earned several prizes, among them for the best book in international European history by the American Historical Association. Meanwhile, Kate had moved to the East Coast to become a professor at the University of Maryland and begun her work on what would be published as Plutopia, Nuclear Families in Atomic Cities and the Great Soviet and American Plutonium Disasters, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2013. And I will not comment on the book because we will hear more about this bold comparative study of plutonium regimes in a minute or three minutes. 
For this second book, she received even more awards, among them again a prestigious prize from the American Historical Association, this time for American history. In 2015, Kate came out with her third book, a wonderful collection of essays on dispatches from dystopia, histories of places not yet forgotten. Here, she reflects not only on some of the physical places of her research, but also on their social meaning, the memories they contain, and on herself, the historian traveler, who on the way rediscovers her own upbringing during the 1960s and 70s in Elgin, Illinois, during the time, that is, when the manufacturing belt turned into the rust belt. I promise to be short, so I will refrain from mentioning in detail her numerous fellowships, the many articles she published in scholarly journals as well as in popular magazines and online. I will skip over the many forums she was invited to, the lectures she gave, and the conference she, conferences she attended. And that is because I need the remaining time to talk about something that is missing in this account of an obviously very successful and only seemingly streamlined academic career. Since her publications, positions, and prizes alone cannot explain what makes her such a wonderful historian. You have to endure this, Kate. I would like to mention three features which for me are essential for a good historian, and which Kate Brown embodies in exemplary ways. The first one, the historian as a detective, is actually a common trope. The drive to find out, in particular, what is, what is hidden from us. To do Russian history at the beginning of the 1990s, or the history of atomic cities, Kate moved in fields with many secrets, guards, lies, and mines. She has the passion and the skills to overcome these barriers and dangers, especially the suspicion and fears of people who know secrets. And she smells them. She wins their trust and does not betray it. I've been you know, wondering if I should say she doesn't betray it because she does use the information they give her. But betrayal is something else, I think. But as any good detective, Kate also has the talent for serendipity, a word I only learned recently, <laughs> enabled by the position that psychoanalysts call floating attention. That is seeing things you did not look for and finding things you did not search for. Secondly, Kate is a historian as traveler who not only physically travels to the places of research beyond the archives, follows the paths which people took or were forced to take, travels with them on buses, trains, and to places they ended up. She has also a wonderful sense for sights and signs that are central to her story. Because finally, Kate is a historian as storyteller. She has the gift not only to tell the big story, but to construct it from many small stories, scenes, and images for the reader to understand the complexity and the ambiguity of the whole. And she understands to tell herself a good story, um, and, to, and she knows that to do that, you have to listen to people's stories and understand their implicit meaning. The result is not only good research, but also very good reading. Kate and I met in Seattle in the mid-1990s when I arrived as a DAD visiting professor for European studies. She attended my graduate seminar, and we sometimes hung out together in the cafes and bistros of Capitol Hill. That's in Seattle. We talked a lot, and yet I only recently learned that at the time, she had doubts if history really was the discipline she should stay with, and if she should not change to anthropology. And also, that she was advised by the time, by some people, to write a more conventional, more disciplined narrative for her dissertation. I am very glad that Kate did not follow this advice, and even more happy she stayed a historian so that she could become an, accept an, an exceptional one. Join me in welcoming Kate Brown to the podium and enjoy her presentation. First, I have to attend to the thank yous all around for that wonderful introduction for um, 
for, Dorothy was a, a very important mentor for me at a time when I really needed a mentor. So it's, I'm, I'm very grateful, and it's a real honor to have you here. Um, and I have to thank everyone at the American Academy for the loving care that um, <clears throat> we receive here. I, there's no place like it, I think, for fostering <clears throat> intellectual camaraderie and creativity and ideas, but also just friendship. So I, I'd like to thank all the, you, you know, you, you all know who you are um, for all you've done for us and, and for my other fellows here as well and their families. Uh, tomorrow is the 31st anniversary of the Chernobyl accident. Um, it's often referred to as the, the largest nuclear uh, disaster in human history, and, and I'm here to disabuse you of that fact. Um, but I do, I do want to say how important Chernobyl is, and I'm, I am now here working on, a, on a, the first documentary history of the Chernobyl accident. I'm most interested in the environmental and medical consequences of that accident, and what I found to my astonishment is that there's hundreds of books written about Chernobyl, but nobody's ever gone into the archives, to f and that's what historians do, uh, start with the archives, to find out what happened uh, to the landscape and what happened to the bodies that experienced that accident in, in an intimate way. And I'll be speaking about that um, later this spring in Berlin and other places, and we can talk about it more in the Q&A. But what I want to talk about today is this book I wrote called Plutopia, um, and it's about the two, I think, bigger environmental disasters in Chernobyl that had to do with uh, nuclear power. And uh, so this book is about the first two cities in the world to produce plutonium. And they produced a lot more than plutonium. They produced model cities and major environmental catastrophes. Um, and, I, and I think they show, looking intensely at these two cities, shows how nuclear weapons transformed American and Soviet society um, changed it irrevocably by compartmentalizing it and militarizing it and contaminating it. So I'm, I want to talk specifically about the Hanford nuclear weapons plant, a plutonium production plant in eastern Washington, and the Mayak plant in uh, the southern Russian Urals. Both of these plants issued two to four times more radioactive waste into the environment than Chernobyl. 200 million curies estimated for each of them. And I thought that was kind of astounding that the estimated number was almost the same. And I wondered, you know, Chernobyl is a household word, and, and then so was Fukushima after 2015. But why have so few people heard of Mayak in Hanford. One reason is that Chernobyl and, and Fukushima involved big meltdowns that occurred, accidents that occurred while the cameras were running. And they were really sort of camera-ready events. Um, Mayak and Hanford were both military sites. They were behind cyclone fencing. But also, there were very few accidents at these places. Most of this colossal contamination of the environment occurred as part of the normal operating order. And when I figured that out, for me, that realization was chilling. Because these aren't small bomb labs. These are big factories with tens of thousands of people working um, in them over 40 years. And not one person, and neither the dictatorial Soviet Union or the democratic United States, spoke up to say, hey, wait a minute, they're contaminating this environment where I live where I'm raising my kids. And so I wanted to figure out why, how that happened. I started looking into these places, and I, and I realized that both towns, in these two very different societies, spawned, both factories, I'm sorry, spawned exclusive cities just for workers at the factories, for plutonium plant workers. And, you know, take a look at this photograph. It's 1950, in the Soviet provinces. They had big famines at the end of the 40s. Um, the one thing you think of in the 1950s in the Soviet Union is hungry, goods starved. But yet, look at these people. Take a closer look. 
these are working class people. These are factory workers, 1950s in the Soviet Union. They look incredibly well fed, well dressed. I mean, it's really only this woman over here who looks like what I'd expect. You know, she's dressed very practically, practical walking shoes. She's looking down to make sure she doesn't slip in the ice. That's how they all should be. But then there's this guy. <laughs> no headgear. Look at his shoes. They shine. What factory worker in the Soviet Union looked like that in the 1950s? Only somebody worked at a special nuclear, closed nuclear city. And it wasn't just the prosperity of this photo, but the, the sense of confidence, one might even say entitlement, that goes in that man's face, that young man's face, that really struck me. And, and so finally I figured out that these cities were the key to figuring out what went wrong, why no one spoke about it for so long. By creating what I call Plutopia, that's a plutonium utopia, which were exclusive child-centered cities for working class plant operators who were paid and lived like their managerial class bosses. These bosses bought from these workers patriotism, compliance, and silence. So let's start at the beginning, and let me tell you first how these places got going. These are colossal plants. It's a whole infrastructure, a network of factories. And the Army Corps broke ground on the American plant in eastern Washington in 1943, and the Soviets broke ground on their plant, the Mayak plant, in 1946. And to build these places, you needed uh, thousands and thousands of workers, construction workers first. And so this is Camp Hanford. Population 60,000 went up overnight in 1943 and quickly became the third largest population point in the state of Washington. And this place had, and that's the Columbia River running right by it, this place had all the, all the charms of a minimum security prison. <laughs> and all the social problems too, uh, single migrant workers boozed and brawled and raped and murdered. Uh, here's a picture of not a prison, not a concentration camp, but the civilian residency quarters for the civilian women workers. And the reason they needed to have guards, barbed wire, and fencing is because of the wolves, the men, would come and get them if they weren't locked under lock and key. So despite the very good pay at this um, construction camp, people hated it. They walked off the job at the peak construction. 440 people a day walked off the job, taking with them their secrets of this top secret site. It was a security nightmare. So they ran around. Uh, the Army Corps is building it. DuPont is the main contractor. They ran around. They spent $7 million in 1943 funds to um, recruit white workers to come to this place. And they kept talking about a labor crisis. I'm kind of a skeptic. I'm like, labor crisis? What kind of labor crisis is there? And they're like, well, all these guys are going off to war. But there was tons of labor. There's 100,000 African-American young men signed up for the draft who have no place to go because it's a segregated US Army. There's 300,000 Mexican-American migrant workers rolling across the inland west in farm security administration camps, all set to go and work. But people who were not white were considered a security threat. So they weren't hired. So they um, finally the NAACP got involved and, and they agreed to a quota. 10% African Americans had to be hired. They brought them in. And then that's something amazing happened. The uh, Army Corps of Engineers introduced the Pacific Northwest for the first time Jim Crow segregation. And what you see here are the, the tavern for the white people and the tavern for the black people. Once they hired minorities, they watched them closely. The, DuPont photographer took this photograph of a, a woman being led away into a black Maria or a paddy wagon, uh, never to be seen again, the other workers said. Was when somebody was taken off, it was usually because they had a suspect political past, like they had been a member of a labor union, or they had asked an intrusive question like, what does your husband do? At the that was enough to get sent away. Um, they were so short on workers that they set up a labor camp. Uh, they brought in prisoners from McNeil, uh, from 
Mikhail Island, and they set them up to work. These were uh, white, conscientious objectors, so they're considered okay. And I found this photograph in the basement of somebody's um, house in Richland. Uh, her father had been the warden of this camp. Now, the Soviets had something called camp construction. And one thing to know about the Soviet Union in 1946 is that uh, the destruction, you know, they really counted among the losers in terms of the World War II, right? Their destruction was colossal. 27 million dead, 25 million homeless, 34,000 factories and enterprises bombed, um, tens of thousands of villages that had been wiped off the face of the earth. So they had shortages of everything, especially labor. So they gave the job of building this plant to the one entity in the Soviet Union that had a lot of labor, the Gulag. And here you see, um, these are, um, they brought in 40,000 workers, prisoner workers. These guys, oops, sorry. These guys down here are uh, German POWs who were brought in to the top secret site uh, to build. And with these hungry, ill-clad prisoners, they set to work building the plutonium plant. And I think from this photo, you can see how these guys building the state-of-the-art nuclear power plant, you know, with the tools and the equipment of the Egyptian pharaohs. Now it's clear from the records that camp construction, as it was called, was no model of prison-like control. Uh, there weren't enough guards, so prisoners guarded each other, and these prison warlords you know, rose to the top to take over, and they ruled the camps with the terrifying violence. Uh, prisoners drank and fought and stole and raped and murdered. One guy, uh, a foreman, crossed one of the prison, one of the thief warlords, and he went missing, and they found him two months later walled up in the cement reactor pit foundation. Um, so now originally, and this is what the civilian quarters looked like. This is where the scientists lived uh, during the um, early phases of this factory in, in Siberia. Now, originally, both American and Soviet leaders thought that once they finished building the plants, they would produce plutonium with militarized labor, mostly soldiers who would live in garrisons and work in shifts producing plutonium, because they wanted to make sure the labor force was secure for this first most volatile project in, the, in human history. But when they saw how these single male workers boozed and brawled and took off in uncontrollable ways, they realized that those who operated the plants couldn't be as volatile as the product they were about to make. So who, what are we going to do? Who's going to produce plutonium? Strangely enough, the answer to that was the nuclear family. <laughs> in order to secure trusted workers, leaders in both countries built state-funded, limited-access cities for civilian plant workers who would live rooted in their nuclear families in these atomic cities. There's the American version of that photograph. Now, security. To protect these new cities and the factories that they housed, FBI and KGB officers set up the usual security systems. They, in both the USA and in Russia, they hired for whiteness, um, no Jews. Well, there were 10 Jews in Richland. There were a few Jews in uh, Azursk, but then they, after 1948, with the foundation of Israel, they got rid of them. Lots of Muslims around the Russian plant, Bashkirs and Tatars, not hired. They even had trouble hiring Catholics. Um, but they did hire women in both places, and, and the, it was gendered. Men worked in reactors, and women worked in the processing plants, uh, because you have to measure a lot. It's like cooking. <laughs> That's what they said. I'm not making this up. But they, um, you know, the, the processing plants, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, were the most dangerous jobs. Um, but these measures, and then they, you know, they, they had people sign, this is the Russian workers, they had people sign oaths and, and uh, renew them constantly. If you don't know Russian, it doesn't matter because it says the same thing in this one. Um, they had people um, planted in the recreational centers in the schools to listen in on people. They, they read the mail, they listened to the phones. But that was all just the first circle of security. Um, what I found when I read through the, the archives in both places is that strangely these big men who were in charge of building the first plutonium plants in the world, 
were interested and, of course, concerned with reactors and processing plants, but they were obsessed with softball games, bus service, housing, supply of chickens. And I kept you know, what was that about? And I finally realized that ensuring prosperity in Plutopia became the chief way of keeping workers compliant and silent and loyal. Uh, the Russians took security a little bit farther. They put a fence around the city. They were thinking of Los Alamos. And so they said, oh, we need a fence. And that fence is still there. Uh, so I've never entered the closed city of Azursk. In eastern Washington, people in neighboring towns called Richland, this Plutopia, United States, the Gold Coast. Uh, it was a strange place. The federal government owned all the land. The contractor, which 1947 became General Electric, ran the town. Um, they designed and built all the shopping centers, the parks, the schools, the housing, and the town hospital, all of which were excellent. There were, um, they selected businesses, gave them monopolies, you know, one green grocer, one men's clothing store. And then when they realized that the store owners were gouging the customers, they uh, fixed prices. They had no elections because there was no uh, local government, there was no free press. And people, you know, journalists would come to this town and they'd say, what's going on here? You know, is this socialism? Is this fascism? Um, but people, you know, they didn't mind, the residents of Richland didn't mind. They said it was a great place to grow up. And, and I'm not sure this photograph really affirms that statement. Um, but what pleased people most was the federally subsidized housing. Um, if you were a male employee, uh, you could rent this, one of these houses, depending on wh where you were in the company flow chart, for $35 a month, including all utilities. Um, it even included childcare. It was a lot like the American Academy. <laughs> but if you were a, a low-level employee, uh, you couldn't live in Richland, like say you're a janitor or a security guard or a um, construction worker. And if you, you had to live not in Richland, which is right here, but in one of these other two towns of what they called the Tri-Cities. Uh, this was a farming town and this was Pasco, was always a working class town. And if you were a minority, Mexican or African American, you had to live in the Pasco ghetto right here by the rail yards. And in the Pasco ghetto, you could rent this shack for $100 a month. Not 35 but $100 a month. Uh, no running water, you know, outhouse, spigot in the fence. As my mother used to say, it's expensive to be poor. I thought you would give me that line. Um, so the contrast between Richland and these sort of dusty uh, railroad towns were stark in the inland west. Um, across the west, these little ranch and railroad towns were going bust, and meanwhile, Richland boomed. And maybe this economic prosperity inspired a, an, an insensitive, irrational love of their bomb. They had a conversation a few years ago. Well, we should, you know, I was eavesdropping online. Maybe we should get rid of the mushroom cloud as our mascot. Maybe that's not good. But then they had a little vote and they decided to keep it. <laughs> now in the southern Urals, locals called the residents of, Az of Azursk, that was the plutonium town there, the chocolate eaters. And they did that because during the famines of 46 and 47, the people who worked at the plant had extra rations of chocolate and sausage. And um, after 19... 49, when they um, exploded the first uh, bomb, Joe 1, they got a lot more than chocolate and sausage. They had excellent modern apartment buildings, theaters, swimming pools, sports stadiums, even a yacht club. And here's just some pictures. That's um, Kurchatov. That's the guy. That's like the Oppenheimer of Russia. But best of all, in good starved Russia, the stores were supplied like they were for the biggest shishki in Moscow. And that's what people really remembered there. This one woman uh, said in 1998, 
we had the feeling that we already lived under communism. We had everything from crabs to caviar. Now, stock stores and good housing were an unbelievable luxury in Russia in the 1940s and 50s. Outside of this town in the Urals were towns, you know, industrial and steel towns with very pragmatic names like asbestos and asbestos too. And in those towns, people went, you know, lived in basement apartments and they stood and they lined up for bread at 3 a.m. and they were still there at 3 the next afternoon. Um, and so for many residents who had come from hard scrabble provincial towns in the Soviet Union of the United States, winning uh, residency in Azorsk or Richland was akin to winning the golden ticket. Uh, it meant a person had arrived in the kind of material comfort, prosperity, and security that they hadn't expected to achieve in their lifetime. Uh, Ralph Myrick remembers the moment his family, he grew up in a, a company mining town in New Mexico, a town of tenements and slag heaps, and he remembered the moment General Electric moved his family into this two-bedroom prefab plywood house in Richland. He said, my mother cried tears of joy. She'd never been in a house so new and clean. She'd never been in a house with indoor plumbing and electricity. But Ralph said his father hadn't graduated from high school, and his father worried a lot. He worried that the supply of plutonium would be satiated and the plant would close down. He worried that he would do something wrong <clears throat> or his, one of his kids would do something wrong, and he'd lose his place in the closed city. Everybody knew if you got fired from the plant, you had a week to move out of your rented house in Richland, never to come back again. Ralph's father knew that nowhere else could he supply this kind of life with his skills and his education, as in Richland. In the Soviet Union, in, uh, the contrast between life inside the closed city and life outside was so big that people appropriated gulag slang and called the world outside the big world. And uh, it wasn't difficult to lose one's place in the socialist paradise if a worker drank too much, brawled, slept with their you know, colleague's wife. They were taken into party meetings and threatened with eviction. If a teenager dressed like Elvis Presley <coughs> listened to the Voice of America, they were sent to boarding schools outside of the town, never to come back again. After a major accident in 1957, people watched the fallout come down from the sky, and they got nervous, and they uh, sent in their um, termination. They, they quit the party. They sent in their termination notices, and they left town. But after a couple of months, I noticed in the archives there's letters, people begging to come back, saying, I can't. I was stupid to leave. I can't live out here. Please take me back. And I think that tells you something, that Richland and Azursk's charms were so seductive, so arresting, that even when people suspected they were putting their health at risk, they chose to stay in their corner of Eden. But this tranquil prosperity of these towns belied the fact, of course, that they were fronts on a Cold War, undeclared fronts. I think this was just a drill. <clears throat> I don't think that was... I really had a reason to wear those. <clears throat> and on this front, engineers and scientists were quietly contaminating the surrounding landscape with millions of curies of radioactive waste. Now, I just have to bone you up on just a few things about producing plutonium to get onto this next part of my talk. Just keep in mind, a few kilograms of plutonium that you need for a bomb core requires hundreds of tons of uranium. Um, so you take hundreds of tons of uranium and you get it down to the softball size of plutonium, all the rest is radioactive waste. From 1948 to 1993, the Mayak and Hanford plants each dumped radioactive waste into the rivers, the ground, and up the stacks into the airstreams, all as part of the normal operating order. Plant managers, in fact, were so invested in Plutopia and making it nice that I find that in the budgets they shift money designated for radioactive waste management over to bus service and housing. And they polluted quietly, both in the dictatorial United, St um, 
sorry, Soviet Union and the democratic United States. And the question is, what's the effect of living and working in a radioactive landscape? Plant workers were the first to get sick. Some died and their deaths were attributed to natural causes. Um, and Hanford officials insist to this day that not one worker died from radiation, um, immediately from radiation accident at the plant. Um, but in the archives, I found a couple of times, not just once, two autopsies for one man. And in 1952 case, um, there was a guy, a janitor, he went to work one morning, he was fine, he didn't feel well, he went home sick early from work, he laid down on the couch, 45-year-old janitor, died. The GE doctor came over from the GE hospital and told the wife, your husband died, did the first autopsy, your husband died of an aneurysm. Um, the second, but she was going to uh, Chicago for the funeral. And she took the body up north, and she dropped the, the, her husband's body off with the Cook County coroner and said, what do you think my husband died of? And the coroner did the second autopsy, which says this man clearly died from radiation exposure. You can see the burns on the arms. And most suspiciously, important organs from the body are missing. She wrote the GE lawyers, sued for workman's comp, GE. Lawyers were on the plane to Chicago within two days, and they got the coroner to retract that second autopsy. So to this day, there, nobody has died at the Hanford plant from radiation accident. Um, in Azursk, workers were especially vulnerable because the plant was built in such haste and parsimony by hungry, ill-clad prisoners. Uh, the money buildings had no biological shielding. There wasn't even money for basics like rubber gloves, rubber boots. Um, in one lab, there weren't enough stools, so workers were sitting on wooden boxes. Inside was low-level radioactive waste. Um, and after about four or five years of production, plant workers noticed that women, a couple of young women in this radioactive processing plant, the chemical processing plant were, were sick in, in strange ways. They were hired with a clean bill of health when they were about 21 years old. By the time they're 25, they have chronic fatigue, um, they've lost their appetites, they're severely anemic, and they suddenly look very old. Uh, the doctors discovered that what they had was a case of what they diagnosed only in this Russian urals so far as chronic radiation syndrome, uh, causes a host of unspecific complaints caused by long-term, low-dose exposure to radiation. Several dozen of these first young female workers died, um, and about 23% of the workers at the plant were diagnosed with this chronic radiation syndrome. Now, <coughs> excuse me, sick workers were, would be a big problem. Sick workers uh, or a rash of, of illness in Plutopia would um, make people nervous, right? It would, um, it would show that the, the assurances of safety were perhaps misguided, wrong. So they had to solve this problem. And, and one way they solved the problem, and, and this uh, Dr. Guskova here came up with this idea, is that it, you monitor workers. Um, in the Soviet Union, they monitored their blood. In the United States, they monitored them with badges. And once a do workers got a big dose, you move them off of the dirty jobs onto clean jobs, and that way you saved their lives, and the workers remained healthy. But somebody still had to do the dirty work. Somebody had to do the plumbing on, on pipes that were ragingly hot. Somebody had to dig on so in soils, dig trenches in soils that, where they had dumped high-level radioactive waste. You know, a Dixie cup of this radioactive waste, if I had it in my hand, would kill all of us in this room. Um, somebody had to carry out construction projects over um, underneath you know, smog coming from the stacks, the yellow radioactive fog. So they solved this problem by hiring or conscripting temporary workers to do the job. In the Soviet Union, that was prisoners and soldiers to do these dirty jobs. In the United States, it was migrant workers and soldiers. Uh, these jumpers uh, were not monitored. After a few years of work, they moved on, taking with them the radioactive isotopes they ingested, taking with them any future health problems they might have. 
um, they left behind an epidemiological picture of a healthy pink plutonium workforce. And this was just a mirage, but it was a useful one. As the years went by, no one questioned locally the safety of these plants, in large part because of the health and prosperity of Plutopia. Health and financial security ensured a great deal of patriotism. Um, now, in Plutopia, superior consuming habits did, in fact, also equal protection. Rather than live off a radioactive landscape, as did their neighboring farmers, residents of Plutopia purchased food and water that had been checked by radiation monitors. The kids drank milk shipped in from elsewhere. Women in the Soviet Union were given um, prophylactic abortions if it was you know, considered that they had uh, gotten too high of a dose. Um, and so the assertions that Plutopia residents were healthier were true, in part because they were younger and more affluent and had far better health care, but also because as modern consumers, they didn't live off the landscape. <coughs> in contrast, downwind and downstream from the plant, farmers um, farmed, right? And here's uh, the radioactive Tietja River, um, into this river between 1949 and 1951, Soviet engineers dumped 3.2 million curies of radioactive waste. They had run out of underground waste storage tanks and they had two choices, either shut down production, not an option, or keep producing and dump it in the river. That's what they did. Uh, it took them a couple of years till 1951 to go down river and uh, take a look at what was happening. And um, the dose of mistri do the Radiation monitors found that um, the kids themselves were dangerous sources of radiation, that everything on these rivers were radioactive, that the people were drinking from the river because their wells, they didn't have any wells. They were fishing from it. They were using it to water their plants. Um, and the sad thing is, is that they still do that. I was there. Uh, somebody was selling mushrooms on the side of the road. Don't eat these mushrooms. Um, here I am visiting a family in this town of Muslumova, right on the Tietja River. And you can see me looking a little younger and um, a little nervous because I was a guest and, and they had made a homemade meal of goose and veal and tomatoes and cucumbers and, and I wasn't going to eat any of it. Um, right behind me is this boy. Uh, the father, when I, he noticed, he had you know, vocabulary for about 60 words and um, 13, and the father said, yeah, that's our Luchivik, uh, our radiant one in the family. Um, and, and many families in that town uh, have major health problems. Um, as the years went by, um, people in the downstream villages fell ill with cancers and leukemia and thyroid tumors, infertility and heart diseases. Kids suffered especially from um, autoimmune disorders, all kinds of chronic health problems, and birth defects. Now, this was also true of downwind neighbors at the Hanford plant. Um, now, they had picked both of these sites because they were sparsely populated, for obvious reasons. But the, the great money of nuclear production brought in a lot of development as money often does. And so what they did out in Eastern Washington is they took this dry land that was no good for farming and they irrigated it with government subsidies. And then they had this land that was immediately downwind from the plant and they um, decided it would be a security threat just to give it to just anybody. So they gave it to vets of the Korean and uh, vets of World War II in Korea. And then these people started farming it. And um, no one examined these farming communities I found until the early 60s when they did a study of 20 people and said they're fine, even though they found uh, two pretty bad outlying cases of um, really high, thiodine, high radioactive iodine content. So the story would end here if it wasn't for a few people who lived in and around these Plutopia who started asking questions. And, and many of those questions were really spurred on by the Chernobyl accident in April 26 of 1986. Um, after that, before that, but also especially after that, activists in Washington state demanded the records of the Hanford plant. They wanted to know how much had been dumped into the environment. 
uh, the Department of Energy, which ran the nuclear power plant, they, they thought they'd trick these activists. You know, that they just people want to pound on Nike missiles. And so they gave them 10,000 documents of highly technical uh, material. And these activists had some chemists, chemists and physicists and mathematicians in the group, and they started reading the documents. And eye-popping stories came out. Um, in one case, they learned that um, the plant uh, scientists had put 11,000 curies of radioactive iodine that goes right to human thyroids into the air just as a test one day in 1949, just to see what would happen. Um, farmers downwind <coughs> described their health problems. This guy, uh, uh, Tom Bailey, has the gift of the gab, like a lot of Irish, and he was a, a real informant for me. Another woman, uh, Juanita Andreevska, uh, did what a lot of people do in contaminated areas, a lot of women do especially, is kept a list and made a map of, you know, um, just real simple, you know, um, B was birth defect, D was for dead. <laughs> and uh, I gave it to a grad student who then mapped out her list. Um, right here you see the chemical processing plant, big tall stacks. This is the Columbia River right here. This is the whole plant area, Depo you know, no population. And then this is an upslope. This is a hill sloping upward. And when I showed this to, the, went back to Tom and showed it to the farmers in that area, they said, yeah, that's the death mile. We always knew that. Um, in 1988, the New York Times featured the Hanford story every day, like a carpet bombing, taking apart the assurances of safety of the nuclear establishment. Now, activists in Russia also held, on, held meetings that took on greater urgency after Chernobyl. Uh, people were protesting a, a new nuclear power plant going up in the southern Urals, and, and people showed up at this protest who had this strange story to tell about a radioactive river and whole villages with kids with birth defects. And some, some activists started looking into it, and they started recording their stories, and they formed groups. The groups had names like the White Mice to talk about how they felt they had been part of a big uh, science project. Now, in response, Soviet or by this time Russian and American officials said that these people were not sick from radiation but were sick from radiophobia, just fear and stress caused by fear of radiation or from heavy drinking and inbreeding. Um, that they didn't have chronic radiation syndrome, but they were just chronic welfare cases looking for a handout. Um, and it was easy to discredit the neighbors of the plutonium plants. Residents of Plutopia had long viewed their poor farming neighbors with condescension. They always said, you know, we're the chosen people, and they used those terms, and the other people weren't good enough to make the grade, and that's why they're griping. But gradually by 1990s, the mid-1990s, insiders inside the plant started to speak up too. And whistleblowers told eye-popping stories of secret nuclear accidents, daily dumping of radioactive waste, and ongoing safety concerns at the plant. Now, security officers harassed and hounded whistleblowers using the whole great Cold War arsenal of spy gear. Uh, this guy, Ed Bricker, um, Westinghouse, by then the contractor at Hanford, parked a mobile home outside his house and from there, they monitored his phone, they took pictures, and they tailed him and his family members. He had two death threats on his life. In one, he was all dressed up in a spacesuit to go into a radioactive canyon, and he realized that his oxygen tube had been cut. So he went to get the, the spare tank, and it was taped to his belt. So he, you know, he managed to get out of the canyon before he collapsed. Um, this woman here uh, on the left, Nadezhda Kuchepova was uh, trained herself to become a lawyer so she could represent people in these uh, downriver communities, and um, she kept at it. And the you know that the Russian government brought her up on tax charges and brought her to court for this and for that, and uh, she just kept going. A um, couple well, summer last summer, she was um, charged as being a Russian spy and was sent um, fleeing uh, with her three kids to Paris, where she's a refugee now. Um, this guy, Tom Carpenter, for the last 30 years has recorded the um, 
environmental um, dumping and problems, labor problems at the Hanford plant involved with the Hanford cleanup. And um, these activists just haven't given up. Faced, against, faced off against powerful state bureaucracies, which were backed up by mighty nuclear security regimes, they refused to step down. And I think the message here is that if the meek are to inherit the earth, they first have to clean it up themselves. Um, so I, you know, I, I, when I first, I just want to end uh, here, but I, I, I had this idea when I first started this book, and I was mostly interested in, you know, in the nuclear security state. You know, who were these pioneers who agreed to be listened to, to have their letters read, uh, to be watched, you know, in order to get prosperity for that? And I thought, you know, that these were sort of um, the founding mothers and fathers of our post-nuclear security state. We all kind of joyfully collude in our self-surveillance, right, in the surveillance of the state and, and corporations over us. And so I wanted to know who these people were. And I imagined a, a monument, you know, and the monument, of course, would be of the nuclear family. And these pioneers, you know, the, um, the kids, you know, they would be, they'd have their arms out for a, a pat down. And um, the father would be handing over his urine sample. And the mother would be looking on sort of proudly, but also anxiously. Um, but as I worked this story over six years, I, I, I've met so many people who told me about their, their health problems. And whether it was in the, the Soviet Union um, or in the United States, they were both mostly farmers who didn't have college education and they didn't know Russian or English, but they somehow had that very similar, eerily similar stories to tell. And as I listened to them, I, my story started to change. Um, so I'll just read you the last... Um, you know, segment of this book, of this book, Plutopia, and then we can open up for questions. Um, in the course of writing this book, I came to know people who could not share a meal with me because of medical dietary restrictions. I met individuals who lifted their shirts to show me the cross hatching of scars left from multiple surgeries. Watching these courageous people who insisted on asking questions, sought their own answers, and spoke even when their supervisors attempted to silence them, I came to visualize a different kind of nuclear pioneer. This group is on the march. Some are wearing protective jumpsuits and masks. Some are thin and pale. Others are children. A few shuffle with oxygen tanks or roll along in wheelchairs. As conflicts over resources, wealth, and power merge with struggles over risk, health, and safety, these people are defining a new kind of citizenship in which they demand in addition to their political and consumer rights, their biological rights. Along with freedom from want and tyranny, they insist on freedom from risk and contamination. These determined people are, in other words, any number of us, as we're all residents of Plutopia. And I'll leave you with one last photo. This is of uh, the school theater in Azorsk. They have a, a pretty high rate of birth defects there, I mean, an astronomical rate of birth defects. And um, this is a special school for kids with um, learning disabilities. And I don't know, I mean, maybe this is a photograph for the future, but it, in some ways it's also a, a hopeful photograph. So thank you. We can take questions, yeah? And Tina will give you a microphone if you're interested in asking a question. Pardon? Yeah, uh, I'm Sylvia Kramer. Hi. Uh, what sort of consensus was there, if any? Uh, in the medical community about measurements, risk exposure, and consequences. That my sense from the reading I've done is that at least in the 40s and early 50s, there was none. But in the course of your work, I haven't read your work, uh, but in the course of your own researches, did you, 
what, what did you learn about persons not part of this project? What, what understanding they had? Yeah, yeah, you know, I get this question uh, a fair amount, you know, well, they didn't know anything about radiation in those times, right? That's not so. So there's a big conference in 1936, I think it was held in Germany. There's a big conference of um, early radiation medicine in 1936 where they determined that even low, tiny doses of any amount of radiation will cause birth defects. That was one thing they knew uh, quite clearly. 1933, there was a big um, study published about the radium dial workers, of course, and the radium dial workers had all kinds of problems with... Um, uh, cancers, of course, but also uh, severe anemias, uh, organ failures of many kinds, uh, crumbling bones, many of the same symptoms that these people with chronic radiation syndrome get. Um, when DuPont's working on it, they read that radium dial study, and they, they've suddenly, you know, in the middle of this project, they suddenly write the Army Corps, and they say, we're making this super poisonous product, and you didn't inform us of that, you know. And so the only safety measures that go in effect are really because DuPont insists on them. Um, you know, the, the army was actually quite uh, like, ah, don't worry about it kind of thing. So um, I, what I found was really amazing on the American side of the story was that um, lots, there was, they were quite aware of the environmental contamination that was going on because they went out and measured. Um, but they, they really didn't make any inquiries about how it was affecting people. And when I went around and had asked, why, you know, why is there no science on this? Why is there no studies? Um, and if there were studies, they were sort of silly and, and were just there to sort of get grants, just to get government funding. A um, couple of officials told me off the, off the record, well, you know, so we did the study. What if we found something? And that's a problem with an open society. I hate to say it. Um, because you can't be sure that there aren't going to be security leaks, you can't do the kind, ask the kind of open-ended questions that they were asking in the Soviet Union, where they were like, no problem. We can do study. We, can, we accidentally exposed all these people on this river. We'll sort of purposely, accidentally. And um, now we'll study them. And so they set up, uh, now they have a four-generation cohort of people who've lived on that river. They're still living on the river. Um, and they, every baby that's born is brought into the study, and they do all the medical you know, makeup on them, and they study them every year for the rest of their lives. Um, because they didn't worry about anybody ever finding out about it, they could do that study. But what happened, you know, at the end of the Cold War, the two, you know, feuding rivals got married, and this, you know, it's hard to remember those days now, but in, in Russia and the United States had all these joint ventures over nuclear projects, and so the Department of Energy basically went in and started supporting Russian nuclear sites, and they changed the science and said, all that stuff about chronic radiation, it's a bunch of bunk. You know, you guys don't know what you're talking about kind of thing. Uh, the Soviets had done more science, but their science was discredited. Uh, you know, along with everything else that was Soviet was discredited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do. Greetings, my name is Adam. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing your wonderful information here. This is a very fascinating talk. Um, I lament that I didn't have my kids here. Um, um, to partake in it. Um, these are the first two members of the Plutonium Club, <laughs> right? And it's a much larger club now. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think of the Yangbyung facility in North Korea, and we have like China and Pakistan, et cetera, have the lessons um, that might be learned from these two pioneer groups um, been followed by other um, or repeated? Or what is the state of people making plutonium in other countries? today. Yeah, we don't know, right? That's the, that's the really odd thing. And uh, there's rumors of a, you know, of a terrible valley in India. There's uh, stories I hear also about a, a Chinese area where they've both made weapons and tested them. But it, all this, to, for me, exists in the realm of lore and urban myth because um, these places are so secretive, people really haven't gotten in to write these stories. I'm Dorothy Schneider. The argument you make about prosperity uh, in the 1940s is, um, in a way, a linchpin around which, as far as I could hear today, a story is constructed. 
American prosperity hit the working class gradually and selectively, but the white working class uh, quite um, in a lasting way, starting in the late 1940s. So um, what was the lure to stay in Hanford and work there? Um, when there were opportunities um, in Seattle, in the shipyards, um, in Northern California, along the West Coast, um, really widely available, including good housing, the GI Bill, education, and workers took advantage of those opportunities. Did the working class um, around Hanford change with a lot of turnover, um, where Latinos or African Americans included in the select club in larger numbers, what's the story? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, you know, some people did, you know, go off and go to other places, but um, people really love these towns. And I think the allure is you can, you could live not just as a well-off American <coughs> worker, but you could live like the man, the professional classes. And not only that, but you could, but you had mobility, right? So, um, your kids were going to get out of the working classes into the professional classes because in Richland, all the schools had um, PhDs teaching in the high school. Every time I, you know, I, I've given this talk at, at universities across the United States, and there's almost always somebody in the university audience who's from Richland, and they stand up and they go, "That's not true," or "That's true." Um, but the reason why is there's more PhDs per capita in Richland than any other town in the country. Um, so if, you're, if you raised your child there, your child was going to zoom into the next you know, echelon. And, and Azure's cat that gave that people that possibility as well. And I think that's what it was. And then there was this, everybody talks about this, the, I mean, they're not, they're not speaking ironically, but they talk about this great place to raise your kids, never had to lock your doors. They talk about the safety and security. You know, these other places in L.A. or Seattle you know, offered more danger and more... Um, social mixing even, right? But, you know, there's an exclusive, segregated white community. They allowed uh, one black family in in 1951 and a second one in around 1961, and, and that was because it helped the basketball team. I, I wish I were joking, I, I, you know, but... <laughs> oh, right here, thank you. <coughs> Hello, my name is Nikita Braginski, and uh, uh, I would like to ask the question uh, whether you think that this is a story about the technology itself or the way it was handled, uh, whether uh, it is imaginable to have this technology and this production of plutonium in, in, a, in, in, a, in a safe way, and that would mean that this is kind of a neutral technology, or if this is not imaginable, and this uh, is um, uh, the problem itself. Yeah. Um, so how much does the technology sort of drive this story, you're saying? Yeah. I, very much so, but in ways that might be a little bit unexpected. Uh, they used to say in Azursk that if you uh, dug a hole through the earth, you'd end up in Richland. And that's how I imagine these two places as on one axis rotating you know, around. And so they're linked together in terms of technology in that they're spying on each other and they're having a conversation without words, but with rockets with one another, right? So when the Americans build a plutonium plant and drop bombs in Japan, the Soviets need to, to build the same plant and drop, you know, and test their own bombs. When the um, Soviets test a bomb, the Americans have to build more reactors immediately because they need to have more bombs so that they can obliterate all the Soviet cities before they build themselves any more bombs. And, and on it goes like that. When the Soviets learn that the Americans are cutting corners on ra radioactive waste management, they have to cut corners so that they can produce yet more plutonium. So on it goes like that. Um, they build the exact same kind of reactors. The Soviets had a different design, but the, the bosses said, no, build it the American way. Um, they, monitor, they notice each other. So Francis Powers, when he flies over, he's flying over the Mayak plant. That's when he gets downed, because he wants to go check it out. So they're busy watching. So they, how many reactors do the Soviets have? They're, they're acutely aware. They, they can tell by monitoring, by putting filters up in the sky, how much the other is producing. Um, and so 
these towns may seem similar to you after my, my presentation. And I think that's not accidental, but it's very much a part of this dialogue. Although they have very different societies. John, way in the back there. Thanks, Kate. Um, but one real difference is that um, they're both government programs, but you talked about GE and I think Westinghouse. So there was also a private partnership in that. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Um, I assume they profited highly from this, um, and I assume they got off scot-free afterwards, um, or have any of these lawsuits gone after them? Yeah. Um, DuPont says they only took $1 in profit from building the atomic weapons. <laughs> Um, and, and that's true, they only had $1 in profit. Uh, so what did they get out of it? They, um, they kept all the patents, which then, of course, were quite lucrative. Um, and then they went on, they got another contract to build the Savannah River plutonium plant, and so they kept going. Um, the contracts themselves were very lucrative in that uh, 20 to, to 50 percent, you know, tw not 50, but 20 to 40 percent could go to administrative costs, which were just, you know, skimmed off by the company to, to do other things. Um, at the end of the Cold War, when this story broke, a lawsuit started in, um, I think it was 1991, and the lawsuit went on for 25 years. Um, it must have started later because it just concluded in, in 2015. Um, and the lawsuit uh, was between the downwinders, uh, there were about 2,500 of them in a class action lawsuit, and then a couple of uh, different contractors, which included DuPont and GE. The, the corporate the U.S. government contractors were indemnified, so the U.S. government, uh, American taxpayers paid uh, $60 million for the defense. And the plaintiffs uh, had this lawyer who went bankrupt, and he was finally 85 when they had to settle out of court. And the plaintiffs got less than, they, didn't, they couldn't tell me how much, but they said it was less than $6,000 apiece. So that's a pretty disheartening conclusion to that story. Um, Nadia Kutyepova, uh, you know, took this, fought and fought and fought these lawsuits in court to try to get compensation for the people on this Tietja River, and also to get money to move them away from the river. They're still there. And um, she um, took it, she would lose in Russian courts and then go to the next hire, and she took it all the way to the Strasbourg court, to the European Court of um, Human Rights. And there, uh, she won a couple of cases, and she, and she lost a few. But be, while she was still busy pursuing them, uh, they called her an American spy, and uh, she had to flee. So that story also doesn't have much of a happy ending. Yeah. Hi, Mark Punninger. Um, Kate, great, great uh, conversation and talk. Um, and I was struck by the human story that you revealed in such complex science, one of the most advanced at the time. Um, and so I'm just curious about your thoughts about Chernobyl and what your, your, your research now. And I know you're revealing a human story there and even going into the world of, of drama as well. So mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk yeah. a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was frustrated at the end of this, when I finished this project, um, because I felt like there was still a story that I, I, I couldn't really show and prove with the evidence I could find from these military sites. And I figured, well, we're, you know, we're, there's been a lot of people who were uh, exposed or potentially exposed around Chernobyl, and that was a civilian site, and there was millions of people there. So I went to the um, archives, in, first in Ukraine and then in Belarus and Russia, and, and dug out the Ministry of Health archives and the Ministry of Agriculture and the, the Ministry of like Hydrology. All the people were measuring, measuring bodies and measuring landscapes. Um, and there what I found was, um, I mean, just immediately, you know, really from that first summer when they start, they, they hospitalize 20,000 people um, who have strange symptoms. Um, especially among kids, especially among pregnant women. And then they follow, um, in Ukraine alone, they follow 300,000 people and do these sort of regular annual medical checkups. And the story there, that is coming into the center is that we have a public health catastrophe you know, on our hands. We have people in these five major disease categories where um, it, you know, we used to have 20% of the population was sick and 80% was, was healthy now in these contaminated areas, that story has been flipped. 
Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to tell that story um, in a way that's not super depressing um, and also uh, relates the way that um, radiation works in, in terms of warping time. So I'm, I'm telling the story in part through a series of screenplays uh, that will be, you won't see them unless you imagine them in your mind's eye as you read. Um, but they're taken from the transcripts of conversations people are having at the time. So it's all, it's, it's nonfiction in a fictional format. Um, and so I'm experimenting with that to see if I can pull it off um, without getting hung by my historian uh, colleagues. Um, but also because I think that um, this is an important story and it's really hard to tell dire depressing stories. I, I find myself always telling dire depressing stories, but I think we have to figure out I have to figure out ways to tell them so that they're readable and that they're potentially hopeful um, and that you can feel what it means to be human in these events. So I, 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 in this Chernobyl story, I'm, I'm focusing on you know, uh, hundreds of heroes who, who you know, said, wait a minute, you know, something is going on here and, and the buck stops with me. I'm going to make sure that this you know, leather factory is no longer throwing radioactive water into the water reservoir where I'm going to make sure that these wool workers aren't getting exposed every time they pick up this radioactive wool and, and get doused with the stuff. And um, so it is, you know, a potentially a, a hopeful story. Please join me in thanking Kate for a wonderful evening and a wonderful lecture. Thank you.